today, sort of once again, I have a lecture title that could be a course title. Um, I sort of hate that about uh, the way I've organized this class, but it, you know, I think that it, it serves an important role to be able to survey a lot of ideas in one language, but uh, I won't be able to say nearly as much as I'd like to say about this in one lecture. But I do think there are a couple key ideas that I hopefully can communicate in a single lecture, and, uh, and even some, some algorithmic tricks that you can take away. So my goal is to give you um, a few of the big ideas and a few specific nuggets from stochastic and robust control. And <clears throat> really, um, I hope that last lecture set us up uh, because the idea from last lecture was thinking about nonlinear dynamics. The toy example that I like to, to use is the marble in the potential well but with Brownian motion, right? And like we said, even such a simple system, nonlinear dynamics, but with a little bit of noise, suddenly has very rich dynamics, right? So especially if that noise is Gaussian or anything that has sort of infinite support, then it'll do interesting things like making escape attempts, okay? And it no longer makes sense. We had to make a fundamental change where we don't talk about the stability of a trajectory or the stability of a, there's a, you know, a fixed point. That sort of went away. Uh, the, the notion of, of the concept of particular trajectories in state space at least disappeared and we instead talk about the trajectories or the stability of the distribution which is represented by the density function over time, right? Which is now, let's say, x. I called it in the discrete time p n of x, right? Which is some distribution. And maybe that distribution for this has some interesting long-term dynamics. Maybe this could be the steady state distribution or stationary distribution. Okay. So, it, you know, I think, I hope I've communicated over the course of the class, I really, I like dynamics and I love the, the beauty of sort of dynamics and thinking about how um, things flow along vector fields and, and the like and how a passive walker could be as elegant as a, as a full humanoid, you know, or fluid dynamics. These are great things and, and really the, the dynamics of the way distributions propagate through nonlinear systems is, is just as exquisite as, as all these other things. I think you can, there's a lot to be excited about and I, I just gave you a little taste of that. But um, the question for today is now let's say I've got a, a, a dynamical system. If I keep it in discrete time for the sake of avoiding continuous time processes, but, but now has control input. Right? How do I design a controller to shape the long-term dynamics of that distribution, right? Okay, so, um, I won't talk about the worst case analysis. We've, we've mentioned that a few times. You can write down the common Lyapunov condition. That was one of the first things we talked about with robust control is if you have bounded uncertainty, let's say the mass is between one and two, you can ask for a Lyapunov function that goes downhill for all masses between one and two. And you can search for control that gives you common Lyapunov function. So there is a worst case analysis sort of version of that, of all, of all this. But we've, we've mentioned that enough and, and there's enough other things to talk about. Let's talk about instead the stochastic ideas here of, of really um, trying to write something about the properties of this distribution over time. Right? The, this, the limited case where you can say something where the distribution has finite support and I'd like to say something for all x, that's too restrictive. So we won't focus on that today. Um, so how do I write down even an objective over this now, um, you know, potentially very complicated distribution? Um, you know, 
know, you can, uh, a very standard thing to do, and the first key idea here is to, is to write some, um, some of the statistics of that distribution down and try to control those. So the one everybody picks is expected value, right? So, so if I had before formulations that looked like this, from zero to infinity, g of x u, I'll now say that my cost that I want to minimize is the expected value of something like that. Okay. And the reason the expected value is so popular is, well, it's not only is it really pretty easy to compute in this, in this sense, but it plays very nicely with the additive structure uh, of the, you know, of the, when, we, when you have this additive structure of the cost function, then you can take the E inside, for instance. This is a huge simplification that's afforded by using the expected value because it's a linear operator. <coughs> That's, that's true. And similarly, I'll see, in, I'll write in a second, the recursive form of the sort of the dynamic programming update stays intact too. But before we do the, the, the nitty gritty, I want to call out that that is cool and that's reasonable. Maybe if I want to say, <clears throat> Um, I'd like my robot on average to perform pretty well. And that seems like a reasonable thing to say. Um, maybe that's what nature does, right? Because I mean, I know, uh, you know, an ostrich runs pretty beautifully up to 50 miles an hour. It also wipes out completely every once in a while. And you can, you know, you can find that on the nature channel, right? Um, so, 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 you know, maybe nature isn't too worried about the tails of the distribution. And maybe we shouldn't be either. Um, <laughs> But if it's an autonomous car, maybe we should. I don't know. Um, there's different objectives. So there's some people think that this is a very um, it's a, it's a very appealing, you know, sort of mathematically, but it doesn't feel um, like it solves every problem. So, for instance, how, how many people did any people see um, Marco Pavone's robotics seminar a few weeks ago? Yeah, I know a few of you were there. If you, you know, I said it earlier in the semester, but if you if you don't attend the robotics seminars, they're great. They're every Tuesday, most every every Tuesday. You, there's a you know robotics.mit.edu. You can sign up for the mailing list. Um, but for instance, Marco Pavone came and gave a talk. He was advocating um, different risk metrics, and he was saying that. Uh, you know, he gave examples of how expected value optimization really doesn't give you what you want in some sort of canonical, in some relatively simple cases. And just like if I'm if I'm uh, playing the stock market, it, it might not make sense to try to maximize my expected reward because there's something bad that happens if my dollars hit zero. I'm all done. I don't get to play anymore. So there's notions of risk and risk sensitivity and and having. Um, different objectives that could be, for instance, um, you know, the value at risk, or there's a conditional value at risk, and there's other metrics that say, for instance, what I care about is just the performance in the tails of the distribution. And oftentimes, once you get into those more complicated objectives, our tools for solving them start getting weaker. But there are some cases, Marco's talk was about some cases where you can still use convex, you can write some of these, these objectives as, as convex objectives. And that's like a budding area of research that I, I would encourage you to keep watching uh, and contribute to. I think it's great. Um, so there, there are cases where you'd like to say something that, you know, not just about the expected value. Okay, but let's see if I can push that. Okay, so, um, but let's say we're, you know, the expected value is already pretty useful. I would say that one of the, one of the lessons I've kind of taken from thinking about stochastic control for, for a while um, 
oftentimes a little bit of asking for robustness or, or uh, you know, robustness in some form to uncertainty goes a really long way. So um, while there are important differences between the different objective functions, different noise models, you know, all these things will affect the accuracy and tightness of your results. In practice, I feel like a lesson has been um, if you ask for something to be robust against, you know, at all, then it's, it becomes, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big sort of, there's a big jump in robustness about things you don't model and other objectives just by asking the question in terms of robustness. And then of course, the more specific your question about robustness, the better you can be. Did I say that well enough? Was that confusing? I don't know. You, there's, some, it, there's something quirky about not asking to be robust, about asking for solutions to only work uh, in the completely deterministic case. And a lot of times I, I feel like that makes these little um, you know, local minima or other, other problems appear that as soon as you try to ask about, you know, it has to work in more than one case, then some of those problems disappear and, and solutions get better. Okay, so um, so yeah, the expected value is is the most sort of actionable in terms of our algorithms because well I, this holds and then even more so the recursion holds. So if I do now um, j is the min over u of in discrete time it was g x u plus j of f. XU. Okay. I could write my W in here if I want to be explicit about it. Then now the stochastic form is going to, because of the additive property of, of the um, expected value, I end up being able to take that on the inside and I could say the expected value of gxu plus j star f of x u w. Now, to me this looks silly um, because well, so if you have, you could have a stochastic uh, evaluate cost function, and reinforcement learning people like to think about that, where maybe the world is giving you some objective function that you don't actually know how to evaluate deterministically. But for me, I would say uh, I came up with G. I know G. It's deterministic. I don't need to add randomness there. So you can even take the expected value even farther inside and do that. Okay. So very powerful now to be able to have the, the stochastic um, equivalent of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And the first algorithm that is actionable is stochastic dy dynamic programming. So if you're willing to discretize or put some basis functions um, over the state and action spaces, then this expected value can be computed just, this, this looks like the transition matrix probabilities times my, my otherwise deterministic update. I, I don't need to write it down, but the point is just that it's, it's almost no more expensive to compute the stochastic shortest path problem on a graph than to compute the shortest path problem. You still do the same um, backups on the graph, computing the cost to go, but now you're just multiplying it by a probability matrix as you do your backups. That costs almost nothing, and you can do stochastic dynamic programming on the discrete time systems. And so for systems that are low dimensional, that can work really well and make a big difference. So first example. So we did the, we talked about the, the rimless wheel walking on rough terrain, and that was a, now, the, the return map was just, uh, you know, one, it was a one-dimensional map, so I could draw it in, the return map in 2D. Um, 
So it, the rimless wheel doesn't have any control inputs. The compass gate is the first one that has control inputs. The compass gate now would be a three-dimensional return map, or if you want to do control in the full four-dimensional space, that's still tractable for dynamic programming. So it's kind of fun to ask, how well could the compass gate have walked on rough terrain if it had control input and you did stochastic dynamic programming? And it's surprising how robust that little thing can be. Okay. On the same random rough terrain, this is the um, the biped now has a torque at the hip, uh, but it has no sensor for the terrain. It's walking blind, right? And if you you see the strategy, if you you know this is now. Um, sort of using intuition to talk about some mathematical th thing, but it's sort of kicking its leg out, right? And sweeping it back, which is all it can really do with hip torque. And that is affording it a more robust gait as it comes down. It's more likely to be able to clear the, the ground and come back and have velocity going forward. And it's a characteristically different gait that came right out of just running dynamic programming on a bigger mesh. Okay. So that's a good that's a good algorithm to have in your pocket, and it's in, a, in fact it really um, yeah it's the code that's already powering the dynamic programming is has the notion of a transition matrix already because that's how we interpolated between the, the mesh points. So it's no it's, it's essentially no different than the way we we solved the other problems, and you can do the stochastic version. Um, but. Let's talk about the more continuous versions because these things don't scale. They're good for they're only good for a few low-dimensional systems. So what can we do with this in the sort of um, continuous space? So um, one natural approach, one natural question is what happens to the linear um, quadratic case, right? So what does what does LQR do if you have this now? Sounds maybe smells a lot like uh, LQG, but it's not quite LQG yet. If you know the, the LQG, the LQG is about uh, involves a state estimation that, that includes uh, sensor noise too. This is just process noise, so um, it's a subset of that LQG problem. But if I have the dynamics. general put a scaling matrix in front of this too, but let's just keep it really simple first. If I have this dynamics, where I'm going to keep it zero mean, and Gaussian, IID Gaussian, We have our cost function. So this is a case where we're going to have a closed form solution. What do you think that's going to be like? What's your intuition? So try to drop any previous intuition about what LQG does or anything like that. And just think about these equations and think about the pictures we drew last time. You know, so what should, what should a system, a linear system with Gaussian noise with an objective like this, what kind of cost should I expect it to achieve? It sounds like a ridiculous question, but it's because there's a good answer. There is a good answer to that seemingly ridiculous question. Minimize the variance. 
Say it again. Variance of the state. The variance of the state. So. Um, Deviation from the mean. The variance is going to play in, of course. But there's a simpler question here, right? So, so remember that the LQR solution. Oh, you, yeah. I mean, is, it, is the cost the cost not going to go to zero, right? Good. Right, so the LQR only made sense because for stabilizable systems where we could eventually drive this to zero, right? So there's something fishy about this. Given this cost function, it's, it's gonna, you know, if the system is gonna only at best bounce around at the origin for all time, right? That thing's gonna be infinity, right? And it is. So, so you know, the LQR with, quad, with Gaussian noise actually does have infinite cost, okay? But it has a particular type of infinite cost that we can deal with, okay? But, but in general, you have to be more careful with these, um, you know, these formulations. In fact, a lot of times when you see the stochastic version of these uh, equations, there'll be different mitigating, uh, you know, approaches to this. A lot of times, people will not write um, expected value of the infinite horizon. A lot of times people will do average cost, for instance, or finite horizon. Right? If you this is often a better a reasonable formulation or um, average cost. could take the limit of that as n goes to infinity potentially. Or sometimes people do infinite horizon but um, discounted cost. Which we did say before, but it's particularly relevant now. So once you have a you know a Gaussian noise or a Brownian motion throwing things around, so you can't drive these things to zero, then you tend to have to play some of these other games in order to get something that's a bounded optimization. Okay, this is a screwy case where even though the the thing goes to infinity, we'll be able to deal with it. All right. So what happens here? So. Um, you know, for the for the linear deterministic case, we had J star uh, was a quadratic function, and it's going to be a quadratic again here. But let's um, plus some extra thing. We'll call it C n. Okay, and this is S as a function of n. Let's say. Um, let, me, let me be care more careful with my notation. J n s n x plus c n. Okay, so it's gonna let's choose as a form something that has a quadratic form plus some constant. Okay, and what we'll see is that this thing has a, a reasonable solution, even though this thing is going to disappear off to infinity. Okay, and what matters is that the control decisions are going to depend on this and not on that. Okay. So if I put it into the Bellman equation, I, I get um, Right with my fingertips. Hold on a second here. This is SN plus one. Okay, I'm not going to take every step just because I don't, 
want to write at all, but I, and I don't think you want to watch me write at all. But um, uh, but this is you know this is just the drawn out version of what we wrote up there, right? And the key is that there's a lot of terms over here. Many of them are linear. You know, when I when I expand this out, I get a W transpose S A X, W transpose S B U, whatever. <clears throat> the expected value of all of those is zero because the expected value of W is zero, and I can take the, the expected value. You know, I can, it's just a, a constant times the expected value of W, which is going to be zero. So a lot of those terms drop out. The one that survives is the W transpose Sn plus 1 W term, and that's what's going to contribute to the dynamics of C. And all of the other stuff, the min over u, with all the stuff that doesn't depend on w, is the same as the deterministic. LQR. Okay? And in fact, the S solution is the same as the deterministic LQR. So the big result of this is that S is the same as discrete time LQR. Consequently, K is the same. And it roughly justifies you ignoring the, the noise. Okay? I would say this is maybe the best and worst thing that happened to control. Ever. It's often known as the separate, I mean, in the case where it's, it includes the, the measurement noise, it's, it's the basis of the separation principle, which justifies doing state estimation, full stop, then use the, 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 most, the most likely state as your feedback controller. So in the full LQG solution, it says your LQR solution is just the same as if you called, LQ, your LQG solution is the same feedback gain as if you called LQR. That's the same K matrix, and you apply it to the mean of your state estimator. It's a magical, magical result that those things, that the, the variance doesn't actually affect K, okay? But it only holds in the linear Gaussian case, and people liked it so much that they do it in all the cases it doesn't make sense too, right? So you know, now we all do state estimation or we do control theory, but we don't really do them at the same time and it's, you know, it's completely unjustified almost always except for in this one case. That's why I say it's the worst thing that could have happened. But, uh, but in this one case it's magical and good that those things separated out. Okay, but it does actually change one thing. There is a solution that, that um, you know, this, the observation here is still powerful and can change the way you write some controllers. So let me give you an example of, of a UAV flying in wind, okay? I'll show you the video first. This is a MATLAB UAV flying in wind, but it's still cool. Okay, so vector field is the wind, um, and that is a uh, well, it's it's a, a vertical takeoff version of our of our plane that is using an LQR controller roughly to stabilize uh, itself in the wind, and it's doing it does a very good job. And it, of course, will will have some Gaussian distribution around the, the stable point, but it performs much better than the one that didn't think about the wind. So I just said that you don't have to think about the, the distribution, um, but we have a controller here that is different than the one that ignored the wind, even though it's using LQR. So let me tell you why, okay? Um, so the basic idea is that wind is not IID Gaussian, okay? So 
uh, at time, if the wind is blowing three, uh, you know, meters per second, or that's pretty fast, but uh, three meters per second at one time step, it's probably not flying, uh, going completely the opposite direction on the very next time step, right? There is some time constant about the way the wind changes in time. And there are some famous models of, you know, the Dryden model of, of the people have accumulated and fit to data over years of sort of, there's a handful of gust models that tell you the distribution of, of wind. Most of them take the form of um, a Gaussian IID, let's say our standard IID Gaussian. Put into a linear filter that pr to produce colored noise, right? So this is now my model of wind. And this is the thing that I'm going to pass into my, um, my UAV model as my disturbance. And I separately have a control input U. And I have a state, let's say I have perfect state measurements, comes back out and I've got some controller I want to build here to make the decisions, right? This is sometimes in, in the reverse, it's, it's called a whitening filter because it takes a process that is a colored noise process that, just, that describes the distribution of possible winds and it lets me think about it in, in terms of an IID process. Okay, so what, how does that change the way we do control? Now, the way we design LQR is by doing LQR of that system. Okay, this system has Gaussian IID input. The state of the system contains the state of the, of the wind and the state of the UAV. At runtime, we actually have to estimate both the state of the UAV and the state of the wind. But then, once having achieved that estimate with a column filter or whatever, um, we have now justified the choice of then doing a linear feedback designed by LQR. That depends on both uh, states, right? sort of a classic idea of, of I mean, e for, for sort of any colored noise, you can do this. It happens that this is a standard way to model wind, but even if it wasn't, if you were just to give me some colored noise that I have to somehow be robust to, one of the things you can do is you can sort of turn it back into Gaussian noise with a model like this, and then do your control on that. Okay? So um, I may have given you the impression that LQR solves everything. Uh, it is a very good tool to have in your toolbox, um, but it doesn't solve everything. In fact, there's a, there's a famous paper by John Doyle about LQG that has an abstract which basically says, uh, the title of the paper is Stability Margins or Gain Phase Margins for LQG Control. And then the abstract is, there are none. That's it, just one sentence, boom, you know, that's a pretty good abstract. Um, so people know that they are susceptible to worst, they, they don't provide worst case bounds. Okay? So this does treat the expected value case, does not give you stability bounds on known disturbances. But it's a powerful result. Okay, so that's the first pass of stochastic control. You guys feel okay with that? Any questions? Yes. Sorry, can you explain colored noise? Colored noise is just something that has um, 
uh, uh, so that, I mean, it depends how what level I should explain it. But basically, the power spectral density, or somehow the, the you, you have more power in some frequencies. It's not that you have equal probability of having every frequency. You now have some distribution over frequencies that is not white noise. Means that you have everything is equally possible possible in terms of frequency in the frequency domain. Colored noise is something that has a, a you know a non-uniform distribution in the power spectrum. So in in I think this is a good way to think about it. Is 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 someone's doing something random and then you're filtering it out to get something that is more characteristically you know it changes more slowly. Good. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so you can do trajectory optimization in the stochastic sense. Okay, so so how would you do tra trajectory optimization with a stochastic sense? Again, if your objective is expected value, now the expected value computation in general needs you to keep around the entire um, the entire uh, posterior, like. Computing the expected value still means understanding the entire state distribution, right? So in my in my Gaussian case where I had a distribution like this, if I wanted to compute the expected value of this thing as it evolves in time, I need to be able to take the integral of my cost function over that whole probability distribution to compute the expected value. So that sounds hard and scary for a nonlinear system you're trying to do trajectory optimization on. So what can you do? Well, you can make approximations of that. You can approximate your system as Gaussian along a trajectory. That's one standard thing. In fact, there's an idea. Um, let me start a new board. So one idea is actually to do um, iterative linear quadratic Gaussian um, case, LQG control. So we didn't actually talk about it, although a few of you are doing it for your project. One way to do trajectory optimization is to have an initial guess at a trajectory in state space. You have some cost function, which you're not minimizing yet. You can make a local Gaussian approximation of your, um, a local quadratic approximation of your cost function, which may or may not be centered on the trajectory. So do the LQR stabilization on that to try to improve this trajectory, and then wash, rinse, and repeat. So iterative LQR. is a trajectory optimization approach. And iterative LQG is actually, I might help you out. Um, iterative LQG is actually a, a pretty good way to do stochastic optimal control. Okay. Now you might think, given what we just said, that if I do iterative LQG, then I'll do nothing more than iterative LQR. But that's actually not the case. So when I when I take my solution along a trajectory and I do a first order Taylor expansion, then I'll end up with along the trajectory. an approximation that is like this, and potentially if I have my noise model in here too. Okay, but I'll actually also end up with some affine terms. Thanks. So 
so we did, if you, if you, I think many of you looked through the notes carefully when we were talking about LQR, but um, there are lots of versions of LQR stabilization along a trajectory. If you're trying to stabilize LQR tracking, for instance, where your um, objective function is to stabilize a path that is not the nominal, traje the nominal trajectory, then there's an LQR version for that too. If your objective function is not quadratic, but is, has a full quadratic form, if it's x transpose qx plus, let's say, x transpose q1 plus q0, that one doesn't matter at all. You know, plus u transpose ru. And you can have off, you know, not a perfect uh, quadratic form in your cost function, and LQR still works for that. And it gives you a solution that is different, you know, that will potentially stabilize a, a trajectory, a neighboring trajectory. If your goal is to stabilize something like this, you can do that with a cost function like this, okay? Similarly, if you have um, first order but affine dynamics, all of the LQR math will work, will work through. The Riccati solution is a little bit more complicated, but this is still in the scope of things you can do with LQR. The interesting thing, and the point I'm trying to make here, is that when you do LQG along a trajectory, and you take linear Gaussian approximations of your dynamics, suddenly the separation principle no longer means that the noise doesn't matter. Somehow the affine terms and the off-diagonal terms here mean that the covariance of your noise does affect your optimal policy, and in fact, by iterating on this, you will do stochastic optimal control, optimizing that objective in a way that's different than doing iterative LQR. Did I say that well enough? I was off script in bad notation, but. But there's also a much easier way to do trajectory optimization, um, a stochastic trajectory optimization. And it really, this, this, picture, I think, is, is really the right way to think about all kinds of uncertainty. So, uh, right, if I thought about my system like this, whether it's model errors or what, there's really only two different ways that um, uncertainty can enter the system, if I'm careful about writing it, architecting it like this. So Wn as an exogenous input, you can multiply it by whatever you want. If it's mass uncertainty, whatever, you can still do that here. And the other set of uncertainty, the other, set of, the other place the distribution start is in some initial conditions on x. You can write a probability distribution over x. But those are the only places that the, the noise comes in. So a simpler way to approximate an expected value cost function with trajectory optimization, and it works really well, um, is to effectively run n trajectory optimizations at the same time with different realizations of w. Okay, so I'd like to optimize a trajectory that I'll, I'll say, you know, I'll choose w n different times, you know, n different w trajectories. It's a finite horizon problem, right, already. So I'll just pick w, w n values, and I'll have 10 different random tapes for w. And I'd like to have a, an objective which optimizes all of those simultaneously, or well, the, the, that optimizes the, a single control parameter. Let me, let me try to say that with pictures here. So now my direct transcription method is gonna think about lots of different possible outcomes, right? So I have decision variables. I have n times or, well, that's, n is maybe a bad choice, but I have k um, times my x trajectories. I have, I have, I have uh, you know, k different x trajectories, but a single, only one u trajectory. I'm gonna apply the same control input, and I'm gonna watch it evolve n different times, and then take, as my, my objective function is just one over n, 1 over k times g of x1 like this, right? 
It's important that you want your optimization to be deterministic. So you pick these once. You don't, you don't call rand in the middle of your optimization. Snap won't like you if you do that. But if you, if you lock these down and do 10 different realizations and watch how they evolve, then you can do stochastic tra trajectory optimization like that. And again, um, you know, this is sort of what I was saying that a little bit, of, even a little bit of sampling, if k is small, you know, for the, for the when we were making the glider perch outside, um, we we did stochastic trajectory optimization with a relatively small, considering the dimensionality of the state space, relatively small number of realizations of, of the random noise, and it got dramatically more robust. Somehow just asking it to be robust at all, you know, characteristically changed the type of solutions we got. Yeah? Is there any way to say how many common examples you need? I mean, this is, this is a, a sampling-based appro approximation of the expected value. So um, I guess I should have even removed that. This is, this is actually how you're, we're approximating the, the expected value. So depending on the complexity of that distribution, you can, write, uh, you know, you can talk about all the statistical measures of, of, of tightness for that. Right? And, and I'm sure that we're never close to where it should be for accuracy uh, in, the, in the applications I've seen. Um, but I found that it, it a little bit goes a long way. Yeah. So, um, effectively, if if you know, a lot of these terms just canceled out because uh, they had no long-term effect on the dynamics. But if I have off-diagonal terms in my covariance matrix, then some of these terms survive. So what happens is that W enters into this solution and does change the optimal feedback gain. It actually depends on the covariance of your noise in a way that it does not in the in the purely linear case. How does that enter as an affine term? There's two things that, that come together to make it work. Um, so I, I make a I make a, a first order approximation of the dynamics, which means also a, a Gaussian approximation of my cover of my noise. If my noise is not centered, it um, is not actually Gaussian. Then you can have you know effectively a, a non-zero mean Gaussian happen. That's enough to see it immediately. That's probably the shortest path to seeing it. If W wasn't zero mean then some of these terms are going to survive. Right? Some of the terms that depend on you are going to also have some dependence on the statistics of W. If you watch how the terms propagate, you can get, some of them can survive in other ways too. But the simplest way to see it would be if you had a non-zero mean noise. This is the pains of trying to give you the big ideas without giving you the details, I'm sorry. Because there's one other really big idea I want to make sure I tell you, okay? The big message here is stochastic trajectory optimization. Um, you know, there's a simple trick that makes it work pretty well, and iterative LQG is something that we can look into more carefully, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good way to make it work. Both of these are, are epsilon changes on the types of trajectory optimization we're already doing that can give us some approximation, some additional robustness to uncertainty. Okay.
last big idea is um, is a robust control idea. Um, have people heard about L2 gain optimization? H infinity optimization? People feel like they know H infinity? H infinity has this plague where um, it's really, there's a couple of ways to see it that's really not that complicated, but if you work on H infinity, you have to make it complicated. You, like you, you use uh, obscure mathematics to write your papers, um, whether it's required or not. Uh, so it's, it's like it's fun. It's sort of really hard to penetrate, but some of the ideas are really easy. So I can give you a little taste. Um, but so. L2 gain is, is the simplest version of it, but um, there's a big idea here which is, which connects to our Lyapunov um, analysis type thinking. So let's say I just have a x dot equals f of x w, and I've got some w coming in, but no control input. Okay. Um, what have we told you about so far? Uh, in terms of, uh, of stability analysis, right? We said um, the basic Lyapunov analysis was look for a v greater than zero. V dot greater than zero implies that x will eventually go to zero. Let's say, right? That's not gonna that's not gonna work if I'm getting pushed around by exogenous input. But there's a way to make these tools scale, okay? Um, this is too conservative. So, <clears throat> There's a, a really important idea um, that roughly takes Lyapunov analysis and goes to an idea called dissipation inequalities. Okay. And the idea is that I should expect X to be um, poorly behaved in the long run. I, I, this is too much to ask. But, it's, but I should expect the, the deviation from X going to zero should be somehow related to the, the amount of energy that was pumped in, the amount of badness that was pumped in. And if I can somehow write that relation, I can start talking about the, um, you know, the connection between, if W was very small, then I could say I'm gonna achieve some, some reasonable performance. And if, as W gets bigger, I should be able to watch or quantify how my performance degrades. Okay, so the idea here is to come up with a supply rate. In this case, of badness, right? This is like how someone's supplying some evil disturbance to my system. I can't believe I wrote of badness on the board, but um, right there's some there's like something pushing on my system, and I'd like V dot to go downhill, but accept the fact that it's not going to go downhill as really bad things are happening. So, and then I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna change my requirement to say that um, V dot is less than or equal to some supply rate. which could be a function of x, but is certainly a function of w. And the idea before, right, was that I could think of a Lyapunov function as a funnel, right, where trajectories were always going downhill. Now it's, there's some, um, you know, the, if, if someone's pumping something bad, if there's a supply into my funnel, I don't know if I should draw a supply into my funnel here, but then I'm somehow raising the, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm filling up some tank of badness and it's allowed to be, you know, going up corresponding to that supply, but whenever the W is zero, for instance, it should go back down. And, well, depending on how you write S, but for almost every choice of S, we want it to be, keep, keep going back down, right? And if we can, 
for some some clever choices of s, we can make powerful statements about the um, the performance of the system despite w coming in. So, for instance, um, you know, for any choice of s here, you could say that v of x at time uh, one minus v of x at time zero. If I just integrate both sides of this from right, so if I from t zero to t one dt less than the integral t zero t one of x w dt, right? So this should be somehow put a bound on this. Good. Yeah, did I ever forget to write my s greater than zero? Um, yes, supply rate should be positive. I think that uh, that's going to be true for for everything we write. It is, that's not strictly required here. This is just an integral. Yeah. Let me actually remove that. I, so I don't know that we, we need that right. Um, the ones we write are going to be trivially positive, but I don't think I'm going to write anything that depends on it. OK. So what can this help somehow uh, tell me? There's a, a nice generalization of this picture here now to say, I've got some um, W coming in. I've got my, and let's say I've got an output Z of T here. One of the things you'd like to say, for instance, is that let's say Z is normally supposed to go to zero. I'd like to say the uh, the rate at which the the amount that this deviates from zero is directly proportional to the amount of energy in this. Okay, and that's the notion of an L2 gain. And it turns out that the supply rate and dissipation inequalities give us a mechanism for solving for um, for L2 gain. Right. So I, it's, this is a very powerful and different way to think about stochastic control than what we said before, right? Instead of saying, worst case, you know, this thing will drive to zero no matter what W is doing, right? Or I want to control somehow the expected value of Z. This is saying, Z is going to be bad, but it's going to be bad in proportion to the energy in the disturbance, okay? It's going to be a longer term statement about this, about the stability. So in particular, I'll write the energy of this thing as its L2 gain. It's an integral over time. Let me keep it as finite time for now. And we're going to restrict the analysis to things where, to, to signals where that has some finite value. Okay. So a bounded energy input. We'd like to say something about the total energy of the output in terms of its L2 gain. In terms of its L2. And in particular, the, the, the idea of an L2 gain would be if I can put a bound saying that Let me explain that in a second. This is the actual gain. Okay. So the biggest, so supremum is just like max, but for continuous um, valued things, right? So the worst possible noise that I could come up with that has 
some bounded L2 gain, right? I want, the, I want to somehow put a limit on how bad the output is to the worst possible thing as a function of its total gain, right? If I get a, a small input, then only gamma squared times that small output. Not on a, for every sample basis, it's got to be an integral over the total energy of the disturbance. It gives me some bound on the total energy of the, of the output disturbance. Okay? That's the notion of an L2 gain. And it's a fundamentally different way to write, to ask for somehow robustness to disturbances. It's beautiful for linear systems because linear systems really do have gains that like this. For nonlinear systems, you you tend to that supremum can be ugly, and you'd have to somehow do a local analysis. Okay, so how do we find a controller with an L2 gain? Uh, H infinity tells us how to do that. H infinity control tells us how to do that. But first, you know. The, let me connect it to the Lyapunov function. If I choose S, there's a particular form of S that if I can find a Lyapunov function which satisfies these conditions with a particular form of S, I can guarantee that inequality is true. Okay. supply rate looks like this, okay, then taking that that integral sort of almost trivially uh, implies that, uh, yeah, so, so this actually could be negative. Yeah, I should have been more careful when I answer you. Um, but, but it does almost trivially imply that, that L2 gain. So a little bit of algebra can show that. So if I say that V dot is always less than gamma squared minus Z squared, okay? So if it's only going uphill according to that, then I have So it gets a, you know it's a little funny to think about this, but I, I can actually I can bound this um, because this thing it, so it has to work for all x, right? If I if I've satisfied one of the Apinov equations, it has to work work for all x. So it has to work for x equals zero. And if I set if I set my conditions, I can roughly I can basically say that this thing is has to be able to even if that's zero. And if I've said that v0 equals 0 and v dot, you know, v of x is greater than 0 um, for all x not equal to 0, then these conditions guarantee that, right? Then I can flip it around and say, And so on and so forth. Okay. So super important idea. I can use a Lyapunov analysis to bound my L2 gain. So 
if you have a system that, that can be described, does have a bounded L2 gain, Lyapunov analysis will, will reveal it. There's a second question now, how do I use control a design to create a system that will achieve a certain L2 gain? And that's where H infinity comes in. There's a whole family of robust control techniques. And they're all super intimidating, like I said, they're, they're unnecessarily intimidating to look at. But uh, I'll give you this, I'll give you the one that looks just like LQR. Yeah, go for it. Why is it? Uh, and how from zero to infinity. So, T squared. The very last line you wrote with integrals. It shouldn't be. It should be T. T always. In this case, you can write the infinite time version of it, but it's simpler to think about this bounded energy over a finite domain. Yeah. What's the difference between Z and X? <laughs> There is a practical difference, um, but you could think of it as, as the, giving you the ability to choose a subset of X or having some output of X, right? This is just some measurement of X that I'm gonna try to care about regulating. I could have written that completely in terms of X and, um, and for a lot of the problems we care about, it'd be sufficient. But in practice, in design, even for the carpool, you end up wanting to choose a different quantity for Z than X. It's also the standard notation of robust control. If you look at um, you know, robust control books, you'll see some standard diagrams. They always use W, they always use Z. So I feel compelled to comply. Okay. Um, so, so let's do some, some robust control here. So imagine I have x dot equals ax plus bu. This is also standard notation. I don't love it, but hey. And j is my um, I'm going to do almost standard LQR design with the subtle difference that I'd like to reward the system for responding to trajectories that have large noise. Okay? So I'm going to reward having low cost. Um, I'll like to, I'm, not, I'm not writing expected value here. I'd like to do this for the worst case W. I'll, show, I'll write that in a second. And I'm going to be able to solve, just like in LQR, I'm going to solve it for all X and for all U. Okay? The way we'll do this is we'll write the min over U, the max over W, is a differential game of J. Okay? I'd like to find the U that gives that, that minimizes the worst possible J that could come up for any adversarial W. Okay? Given that the dynamics are slave to the, you know, W comes in and affects my dynamics. I'm gonna reward, you know, big W's, but I'm gonna somehow penalize W because it's going to affect my dynamics. So a good controller is one that minimizes this cost function even in the face of that W. Okay, it 
turns out that this almost standard LQR derivation um, works its way through for this. Okay, so if I do min over u, max over w of my, let me just save myself some writing and set those to one. X transpose X plus U transpose U minus gamma squared W plus partial J partial X X dot plus partial J partial T okay So we have a positive quadratic form in W, a negative quadratic form in gamma, but the max over the negative quadratic is gonna be well-defined, right? Just like the min over the positive quadratic form in, in U is gonna be well-defined, okay? If I choose, like I did before, always, that I can compute the, the maximizing W, the worst possible W, by taking the gradients of this and setting them equal to zero. That gives me my, my critical point of the, of the negative um, W, right? And that tells me that, so if I do the max over W, implies, you know, so take that partial partial W equals zero, implies that um, negative two gamma squared W transpose plus partial J partial X BW transpose equals zero. Okay, so I can solve for the worst W straight up even before I solved the, um, the worst possible control. I can then insert that in and do min over dub, min over u. It's the same as before. But my Riccati equation is different. I pick up an extra term here. look for the state, you know, in the time invariant case, I can look for the steady state solution of this. Okay, so sorry to have done some algebra there, but uh, it turns out that if you, that you can design a controller that has a guaranteed, um, a guaranteed L2 gain, okay, doing essentially the same control design as LQR, you now have to tell yourself, tell your system about the noise BW and through BW. You have to pick some um, some scalar cost on on W gamma squared, and then you can sol you can solve this this slightly different Riccati equation and get a controller out. Now, this one is different in an important way. So the Riccati equation had the property that it always had a positive definite solution. This one does not always have a positive definite solution. The ability to have a solution depends on your choice of gamma. And in practice, if gamma is infinity, you get the LQR controller back, so it always works. If gamma is zero, this thing doesn't make sense at all. So, if, so, so um, the way people do H infinity control is you do a line search on gamma. There's some powerful theorems that say that once you find a gamma that works, any greater gamma will also work. You 
try to find the smallest possible gamma that will that for which you can design a, a stabilizing controller, and that gives you your and for every, any any controller that comes out, you have an L2 gain of gamma. I feel like I said that too algebraically, so so ask questions and help me make sure that lands. The gamma you choose as in your cost function guarantee you the same as the L2. How can we see that? So you can effectively see that um, because J dot, let's see if I can see it right here. It's, it's, it's exactly the same. So you have the property that once you see that is J dot is going to be less than or equal to gamma squared. It's right here, right? So what's J dot? It's, it's gamma squared omega transpose omega minus x transpose qx minus u transpose ru, which is exactly the same as our supply rate that we had before, where this is now our, our z, is, is, a, is a combination of x and u. Okay, so J dot goes down with the supply rate exactly like our Lyapunov function. So J becomes our Lyapunov function and it guarantees the L2 bound gamma squared. If you choose gamma too small, you say I want, I want to design a system that has an L2 gain of 0.1, it might say there's no positive definite solution, you failed. If you say gamma is allowed to be infinity, then it'll not only succeed, but it'll return the LQR solution. And as you get, and so the, so the, so you, you, this is a scalar. You literally do a line search saying, okay, does five work? No. Does six? You know, and you find the smallest possible gamma for which you, you can design that controller, and the output will be something that looks and smells like LQR. It's still a linear controller, but its cost to go function and the thing you're going downhill has been tuned. To, adjust, to, to provide this extra certificate of robustness to BW. H infinity is very hard to penetrate. This is, I worked hard to find the simplest version of this. I think that's very intuitive. Okay, and if you, if you have intuition about LQR, you can sit there and think about how this twists the solution around. But I don't know that it's it's not, you know, so it's not obviously graphical. I don't have an obviously graphical depiction of it. But it does twist the optimal cost to go function in order to accommodate the the uh, the disturbance that's being poured in, the badness that's being poured in. Okay, so that was a whirlwind and maybe too much or so. I apologize if it's too much so, but I hope there was a couple big ideas that came out. So expected value works with additive cost. Dynamic programming, if it worked before, it will work again. Okay, LQR basically still works and justifies ignoring Gaussian noise, unfortunately. Um, trajectory optimization works. You can use the LQR type approach or you can just do an approximate, it's like a sample based approximation of the expected value. You could, the picture you could have in your head is almost exactly like those the limit cycle, you know, the, the particles flowing around. You're just trying to optimize the performance of all of those particles simultaneously. That's the picture you want in your head. And you can do trajectory optimization with that kind of, with it, a, a, an expected value type objective. And then there's this different, I think, bigger idea of how to do robust control where you use this notion of dissipation inequalities to accept that the system is going to go downhill most of the time, uphill a little bit as the disturbances come in, and if it goes uphill at a certain rate, I can put a bound on how bad my solution is going to be in the outcome. That's a very powerful different idea 
It allows me to say things about systems that aren't absolutely stable, but still design controllers that will behave better in the face of disturbances. Cool. Okay. Next week is reinforcement learning. Uh, I'll see you Tuesday.